I know a good amount about it. So hopefully I can give you guys my knowledge as best as as best as I can. So quick poll. How often do you guys use the debugger? When you say debugger, are you talking specifically about breakpoints, console logs? Yes, I'm talking about I'm talking <laughs> about putting in breakpoints, executing your code in the debugger environment, and stepping through your code to troubleshoot a problem. How how often you guys do it? I Zero? never do that. Okay, never. Then this is for you. Uh, I, I don't really the, do it often, but that's just because I'm early on. Say, say that again. Um, I'm pretty much just starting out, um, okay, okay. but I don't use it too often yet. Cool. Well, you will have, at the end of this, you will be at a huge advantage. So, cause I, dude, I cannot tell you, I cannot tell you how, how much better using the debugger will make you as a coder. Um, my whole, so my goal for today is to convince you all to never use console log ever again for debugging purposes. There's nothing wrong with the console log. Me and console, man, we're, we're, we're homies. We, we hang out on the weekends, but it's not the console's job to debug for you. It's probably the worst habit that new coders have is using console logs instead of using the debugger. Personal now I understand, that. I understand why console logs are used so often. One is because it's easy. There is, there is that aspect of it. Um, it's, uh, but that's about the only benefit of a console log is that it's really easy to use, but the problem, I'm going to list out all the problems with using console log for troubleshooting. First of all, uh, console log um, only you you only see the output of a console log once the program has finished running. So you get a one dimensional view of all your console logs after the program is run. That's a problem because you don't you lose you completely lose the context of what's being printed. Uh, so you, it's very misleading. So whatever output you see, not only do you not know the context of what you see, you see everything all at once. It's all bunched together. Sometimes if you've got a lot of data being printed, it's all, it's formatted just as, as, a, as terminal text. It's really hard to parse through it. Uh, it's not readable at all. You lose, you don't know at what point in the code that console log was outputted. Now you can kind of make your life a little easier by giving labels to your consoles. You know, you could give the first argument of your console log. I'm gonna start sharing my screen uh, to start giving you guys some examples. So, um, so like, okay, sure. You could say, here's my value. Can you guys see this okay, by the way? Okay, so now, now I can console log test, but I could also, you know, console, console log does have a couple of, you, it can take multiple arguments. So you could do like, you know, test. And then when you run this code, you'll see, um, you know, you'll see your little label here. So, okay, you can kind of get around this whole um, not knowing the context of your code being run, but it's still unreliable. And plus it only runs in the order it gets called. And then at the end of it, you just have this output that's just spit out. So for example, suppose I have a timeout. So I'm gonna say, I'm gonna have a value called X. I'm gonna let it be zero. And uh, in fact, we're gonna use let, not const for this example. And I'm going to, uh, I'm going to do a set timeout. 
and I'm going to sorry, not a ten, ten I meant an interval. Okay, we're going to set x, we're going to add one to x, and uh, we're then just going to say if x is uh, less than 10, we'll just clear the interval. Okay, now the thing is, is I want to console log x. Okay, so what's uh, what's one problem with this right out of the gate? I want to know what X is. Out of scope. Say what? It's out of the scope of the function. Uh, it's not out of the scope of the function. It shares the global scope. So I don't want you to think of this from a coding standpoint so much as a, like, I want to know the value of X, like every time that it changes. It's not, it's not calling the console log every time X changes. It's right. It's not right calling the box. console log every time. And so if I console log X, uh, if I run this code, Oh, that's, oops. I'll try that again. Okay, so it's zero. And now nothing's happening. Okay, cool. Well, let's let's put this console log in here now. Okay, and I'm gonna I'm gonna set this interval. I'm gonna set this interval to uh, I don't know, five hundred milliseconds, so half a second. And let's see here if that should have. What's happening? That shouldn't. That should call this every. Oh, okay. So here's a here's another here's another fun one. What's happening? <laughs> it's logging the outside the interval first. Yeah, so it's logging outside the interval first. So this is another instance where your output of your console log is not, it, this doesn't give us very much information. Right, we're saying, okay, zero. We're seeing zero first, but then we're seeing one, which makes sense if you understand, you know, how intervals and timeouts work uh, because they're asynchronous and all this stuff. Um, okay, fine. But the problem is that like, I, I'm not really, by console logging here, I'm not getting a whole lot of information. Like I, I'm not really, um, I'm not really getting to see the behavior of my code very well. I'm getting to see zero and one, and then it's blank, and then it just, and then it disappears. And that is, that's a problem, especially if we're trying to debug this. Because the thing is, I, I, you would think that by looking at this, we would see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, right? Or it would end at nine because we're saying less than ten. Um, but that's not what we're seeing. And even when we console log, it's kind of not really we're not really seeing what we want. So it would be better if we had a way of seeing our code execute in real time and being able to pause it. Well, it just so happens that we do have that and it's called a debugger and it's awesome. 
So we are going, so today we're gonna look at the, the debugger that's built into VS Code. Um, pretty much every browser, every editor has some sort of debugger functionality built into them. I use VS Code every day and I'm used to it and I like it, so I'm gonna use that. Um, the Chrome debugger is, is decent as well. Um, we'll uh, get into that a little bit today, uh, but I'm gonna show you how you can debug any node project and any um, front end project using VS Code and just VS Code, which is really awesome. Uh, there's a couple little configurations uh, you need to do, but it's very easy and it works pretty much out of the box for like most cases. It gets a little more complicated when you're dealing with TypeScript and things, but for, for, um, uh, for, uh, like, like Brad, you said you're, you're just starting out. So this is perfect for your situation. Um, it does not require a whole lot of setup at all. Um, so, okay. The only assumption here is that you have VS Code and that you have Node installed. Um, that's, all, that's, that's all you really need to get this working. Um, there's an extension that we'll look at in a second. It's the Chrome DevTools extension that you need for debugging um, browser-based code, but we'll worry about that in a second. Let's start with Node, because um, it's kind of the, I don't know, it's the easiest to get, to get up and running. So in this case, um, I've got this code here, okay. Um, now I want to debug this. So I've got a couple options. So the first thing I'm gonna do is over here on the left, there's this uh, little debug icon thing. And this contains the, uh, there's this little menu here um, that you can debug from. So uh, run and debug is kind of like a really, really quick and easy way, although it's not very reliable. Um, you can't always, uh, I prefer to just create a launch JSON file. So if you click on that, it'll ask you some options. Um, we are going to use the Node.js legacy. To be honest with you, I don't know the difference between these. Um, that seems to be kind of new. So I don't, I don't know what that means. So let's look at what just happened. So all I did is I went to the VS Code thing or the debugger, clicked on uh, launch, uh, create a launch JSON file. And all of a sudden I've got this fancy JSON file here. Okay, let's see where that comes from. If we go back to our files, notice how by default VS Code creates this folder called .VS Code. And this is just the default folder that contains workspace configurations for this particular project. So if you were coding with lots of other people, you'd wanna code, you'd wanna commit this with your code so that everybody on your team could use the same VS Code configuration and run the same tasks and run the same uh, linters and all that stuff. Uh, so this is just the default VS Code folder that's re relevant for this project. So this launch JSON file, it looks a lot scarier than it is. It's, it's really not too crazy. All this is, is a JSON object that just tells VS Code what kinds of debug configurations are available. So I click over here, you'll notice that by default, this is what's created when I select that, the, the node selection from that dropdown. So you'll notice there's a name here. Uh, there's a type which says node. Uh, request, we'll worry about that in a second. Program is this. Now I'm on a Windows machine. Uh, if you're on a Mac, your paths will look slightly different. Uh, in Windows, it's a double backslash instead of a single forward slash. So that's why you're seeing that. Okay, so, and don't worry about skip files, that's not important. So th some important things are this name. You'll notice that up in this list here, uh, these are your selections. Okay, so this maps directly onto this. So whatever options you have in here are gonna show up here. So if I had more configurations, I would just see a list of them here. 
nothing, nothing crazy there. Okay, this program, this is saying, um, this is saying what, uh, what's the, what's the entry point of your program? Like, what's the, what's the file that you want to run? Um, in my case, I, I only have one file, obviously, so it's just my main JS file. This right here is just a variable that VS Code uses internally to find the absolute path to your uh, to the file you want to run. So um, that's what that means. So this is just saying, hey, whatever the folder is where I'm at currently, this project, in my case, it's Code Talk Debugger, go into that folder, find main.js, run that program. That's it. Um, oh, and this uh, this is the type of uh, debug mode it is. Um, there's two versions that I know of. There's launch and there's attach. You don't need to worry too much about that. Launch just means I'm going to launch this program from here. Um, if you, there are ways that you could launch it somewhere else and then have this attached to that process. We're not going to worry about that right now. We're just launch. We're just launching our program in a debug mode. That's it. So let's uh, see what happens when we run this. So I'm going to click on, go back here. And uh, so if I wanted, I could rename this if I wanted. Um, okay, so notice this changes. This is now called debug main. I'll select that and I'm gonna hit play. And uh, you'll notice that some fancy things happen. And, uh, oh, okay, check it out, check it out. So I'm seeing kind of a similar output to what I had seen when I ran it, when I had run it here. Um, but it looks a little different. Um, you'll notice that things turned a little orange for a second and these controls showed up. Oh, but then they disappeared. Okay, so in order for this to really work, we have to put in some breakpoints. So does, has anyone heard the term breakpoint? Does anyone not know what a breakpoint is? I don't expect anyone to really know what a breakpoint is. It's just where you stop the code running. Yeah, it's like a bookmark. So what the debugger is doing is it's running your code. It's just executing the program, uh, but, but it has this cool feature where it allows you to place bookmarks in your code on specific lines. So in VS Code, a breakpoint is recognized by this red dot. So whatever line you put a breakpoint on, uh, the debugger will execute the program until it hits one of these breakpoints. And it will stop right before that line is executed. And that's a key, that's a key thing to remember is it stops right before the breakpoint, not after. That was confusing to me when I first learned this. So uh, the bookmark happens right there. So what I'm gonna do is I'm putting my, I'm putting my breakpoint right inside of that uh, on line four, right inside of this callback function here. And I'm gonna run the debugger again. And uh, you can hit F5, that's the shortcut for running the debugger, or you can just hit the play button, whichever, whichever you want. So check it out. Now we've got kind of a cool, uh, we've got kind of a cool thing going on here. Notice these controls are up here. They kind of look like audio controls to like an MP3 player or something. Um, we're going to look at each one of these. Um, and you'll notice that there's this yellow bar here and the breakpoint is surrounded. Um, there's some things happening up here. So this is what we're going to take a look at. So the huge benefit that the debugger has over console logging is you have access, you, you can run your code and see what values and expressions your program contains in the context of its execution environment, which means that you can see what a value is at a certain point during the execution, which you don't really, you don't really get that with a console log. Um, we can literally stop here and investigate at this point in the code. I'm on line four. My code has stopped 
on line four, and I can now look around and see what variables and expressions exist at this point in time during the execution. It's very cool, it's very powerful. So let's take a look at some things. So variables show us, uh, well, what variables exist currently. So uh, right now there's not really much here, um, but let's look at this closure. Check it out. Now we've got something. This interval, well, that seems to be this guy. Cool, so if you hover over a value, if it's in scope, you can see what it is. So check it out, x is zero. Interval is this fancy object, which is uh, an interval object, which is the output of set interval. And if I look at this, I can see what that is. Now, I don't, um, some of this is a little overwhelming, so we're not gonna worry about all these like crazy things with the underscores and all this crap and prototype and double bracket stuff. All you need to worry about now is the fact that we can look at the value of things at the moment in time that this program is running at this particular line. Very cool. So right now we're at line four, X is zero. And like I said, the breakpoint starts before it, okay, which is why X is still zero, even though it's saying plus plus. So if I go to the next line, by stepping over, we're going to look in, at step into and step out of later. For now, step over lets you kind of go to the next line. This button continue goes to the next break point. So that's the difference between continue and step over. So we're going to do step over. And there we go. It goes to line five. But check it out. X is now one. Pretty cool. So now if we go to, we're gonna step over to the next line again. We're now in line six, X is still one. Uh, notice our console log executed. That's very cool. Um, but we don't need to care about this anymore because we can literally look at it right now and we can be like, okay, cool. Yeah, X, X is doing what I think it is. It's, we're adding one to it, cool. Uh, now, the question is, all right, well, um, can we, suppose I want to then know if this code's gonna run. That is where, now we could either, you know, continue executing it, of course. Um, or we can ask the question in this watch area, Suppose I wanna know the value of this expression. Is X less than 10? Now, this is a simple example because if we know what X is, well, obviously one is less than 10. But just for just to illustrate what you can do in this area, this is really cool, this is really powerful. So in this watch area, we can actually write in JavaScript code um, and we will see what the value is of that expression. So it has to be an expression, we can't write like, if statements and switch statements and, and stuff like that. But we can write uh, expressions. So if I wanna know what the value of X is less than 10, I can just literally write it. So I'm gonna say X is less than 10. Check it out, it's true. That's because X is one in this case. So if X is less than 10, it's going to call this clear interval function. Hey, so, Ben, I looked away yeah. for like a nanosecond. Where did you write the expression in the right over there? Yep, right here. So you can either okay. double click okay, or you cool. can hit this plus button. And that's how you're watching the X too, right? Uh, the X is just showing up because it's a variable. Okay, cool. But you can, but you can too, like absolutely. I could just okay. write X and I'll see it there. You can watch variables. Okay, cool. Sorry, yeah. I had a work call too. And No, you're good. You're good. But I'm... <laughs> This is awesome. Um, cool. I'm up to date. Great. Cool, cool, cool. So now we know exactly why our uh, code is going to 
one and stopping instead of going all the way to 10. It's because we, I wrote this wrong and I did that intentionally. Because <laughs> now we know that, oh crap, that's less than 10, not greater than 10. So it's gonna clear the interval immediately once the very first time this interval runs. So I'm gonna, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna step over and uh, we're kind of at the end of that if statement, or yeah, at the end of this block. I'm gonna go out this way. I'm gonna keep going. And eventually, eventually the program ends. And uh, as you can see, it's, none of these values are available. The debugger stopped running, everything. So everything stopped. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna now switch this to greater than, which is what my original intention was. And we're gonna run this again. And uh, I'm gonna get rid of these console logs because we don't need them because we are now professionals. Cool, so if we step over, so here's my variables over here are my uh, watch expressions. Uh, I like putting variables that I care about in here so that I don't have to go searching for them here. Um, if you're dealing with like a you know really big program, this guy can get pretty crazy. So being able to just watch for specific items here um, is pretty helpful. So all right, we're gonna go here, step over. Okay, x is ten. That's true. Um, oh wait, sorry, that is that expression is old. Uh, notice how x is less than ten. Well, yeah, that's true. Okay, well let's look at x is greater than ten. Well, that's false. So now my clear interval should not execute. And uh, if I hit continue, it will take me to the next breakpoint. Now you're probably wondering, well, there is no next breakpoint. I only have the one breakpoint. However, because this is an interval, we know that this callback function is getting called every 500 milliseconds. So that means that there's actually a possibility that we'll hit this line again, because this as long as this function keeps executing, we can actually keep going to the next breakpoint. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hit continue. Check it out. We're back to line four. And if I go to the next line, after line four executes, what's gonna to happen to X? It goes up to two. That's awesome. And if I keep doing this, boom, to three. Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then the very last time, it'll go to 10. But at this point, it's going to clear our interval and our program will end. So I don't know, I don't know about you, but I feel like that is a much more informative way of seeing what's going on here than just using console logs. Would you agree? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Oh yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so does anybody have any questions so far? Would never mind. I'm I'm kind of curious on how you do this within like a react app, right? Like, yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And we're gonna, and we're gonna um, that's what we're gonna get to um, right after this next part. I'm glad you asked that. So yes, we are, we are going to apply this to an actual react app. So cool, any other questions? Cool, I'll take that as a no, we'll go to the next thing. So um, now this is a very, very simple example. I just have this one little code here. Well, okay, let's say we have, let's say we're doing, um, uh, now Brad, this will be very helpful for you, uh, especially as you do your, um, you start working on some of those uh, initial, uh, initial projects project with, with HTML and CSS and, CSS and JavaScript. JavaScript. Great. Um, can, can I ask you where, where are you, are you in V school? Yeah. Okay, cool. What, uh, are you on like the level one or two? So I just finished the colossal RPG that okay, capstone cool. for level one. 
So okay, I actually have my assessment tomorrow. <laughs> oh, beautiful. Woo! Beautiful. That's awesome. Well, good luck with that. Thanks. Yeah. So um, uh, you are going to be wanting to use this all the time once you see okay. this. So what we're going to do is I'm going to add an HTML file here. And we're going to make like make a little like button that just that triggers, triggers a, click. a click. Right. All right. Here's my little thing. I'll have a button. We'll, we'll just give it an ID. All right. I mean, JS, I'll get rid of this stuff and I'll just go ahead and get that uh, button from Tom. And we'll just say, hey, when you click this function, we'll add some logic in a second. Okay. And uh, we'll just have a little counter. So we'll put a div here, and this will be our we'll default it to zero. Okay. Okay, so with this, and let me, uh, let's run this guy, add a script with our main JS. Okay, here's my crappy little button clicker app thingy. Okay, right now it doesn't do anything. Hey Brad, can you um, mute your mic? Yeah, sorry about that. We're getting like Ben twice. Thanks. <laughs> Yeah, you don't want too much Ben. So, all right. Now, I've got, if I want to run the debugger here, um, I've got two options. One, I can use the Chrome debugger, which is pretty great. Um, I definitely don't have anything against uh, the, de the Chrome debugger. Um, if you go to sources in DevTools, you'll notice that there is a um, by default, it'll go to this page here. And if you click on main.js, you'll see that, hey, look, here's my code. Now, if you're doing just plain vanilla JavaScript, this is, this is usually just fine. Um, if you're doing like TypeScript or you're doing uh, um, React or something, uh, because of the because of the fact that code is getting transpiled into other code, sometimes this isn't the most reliable place to do it because of source mapping and everything. Uh, there are ways to um, get over that problem for sure, uh, but that is a lesson for another time. So we'll just, for now, we're just assuming that you're writing everything in plain vanilla JavaScript and uh, this is totally fine. So. If I were to put a breakpoint here, uh, notice the interface is a little different, but we still have our friends, the watch section. We've got the call stack, uh, the call this section scope. We can look at our breakpoints here. Um, so if I wanted to watch, for example, the count, I can put it there um, and now, uh, there isn't like a start button. It automatically goes when the page loads. So in this case, I'm going to want to just refresh. So I'll just uh, hit control F5 or control R. And now my code is running. As you can see, here's my button, which is, and it, what's really cool about doing this in the browser is that when you hover over DOM elements, you'll see if you look to the left, I can't really move my mouse or else it disappears, but um, if you look to the left, it actually has a, it highlights, it highlights the, the, the actual DOM element. That's amazing and, and ridiculously useful, just so you know. So if you ever have problems where you can't find where, where the, the, the query that you're doing on the DOM element 
showing up as null or undefined, the breakpoint, putting breakpoints in here, you'll immediately know because it'll show it as null, right? So, all right, cool. So we have access to this to this button element. You can see all the crazy properties that it has, um, et cetera, et cetera. Here's our, uh, here's some text. And you'll notice that um, has all its offsets. We can see all of it. It's amazing. It's really cool. Uh, this is not something you can do with a console log. So another reason not to use a console log. I'm going to be trash talking console logs constantly today. All right, let's go to the next line. So again, here's the step over button. Here's the continue button. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll get to the step into and step out of uh, a little later when we go into the React stuff. Um, it's just, it's, these are just controls for how you navigate through your through your code as it executes. Um, they, all, they all just serve slightly different purposes. So the step over is just for going to the next line. So let's go to the next line. So now we can see count is zero, cool. Um, and if we uh, step over the next function, now we can see that there, um, if we go to, um, I don't remember if the click listener actually shows up on the on the on click. I don't think it does. Yeah, so on click still sh shows null, despite the fact that I've added an event listener. Um, Does click show up as null? Yes, click shows up as null because click it. Well, click first of all isn't a property of of a button. Got it. So it, that'll be undefined. Uh, that's a good question though. So I'm just trying. I don't remember if if the events actually show up on this or not. I I forget. Um. Yeah, I don't see it. All right, so. Uh, we're just going to hit continue and now it ends. Okay, so all that happened here was we grabbed the element, we set the count to zero, and then we added an event listener on this button element. That's it. Okay, now what I want to do though is show you how you can debug your code when you're running, when you're writing event listeners and stuff. This is really useful. So suppose what I want to do is I want to um, Every time I click this button, I want the count to update and I want this guy up here to update. So what I'll do is let's grab the uh, let's grab the counter. Oh counter count. Yeah, counter. Okay, cool. So Go here, and now we'll uh, we'll uh, wire up the logic a little bit. So let's put the uh, we'll say counter dot inner text is equal to count. Okay, and then uh, we'll we'll erase that so that everything's being done dynamically here. So. All right, so now we'll just say count plus plus counter dot inner text equals count. And I'm going to put my breakpoint on line one here so we can start from the very beginning. Okay, from the very beginning. Notice count is not available. Uh, there's not really a whole lot happening. Button count counter, everything's undefined. My program hasn't even run yet. Step over, button should now turn into a button. Yep, there it is, it's highlighted. Scroll to the next line. Counter is now a div, very cool. And then we'll step over again. And on line six, we're going to be setting the inner text, which currently, and notice how when you hover over it, you can actually see what the value is. It's an empty string. That's pretty cool. But now we're going to set it to this value. 
and boom, it shows up the moment that I stepped over to the next line. Okay, cool. Now my event listener is uh, going to get registered and our code will end eventually. There we go. All right, let's 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 just see if this even works. Hey, check it out. That's pretty cool. Suppose though, I want to look at what's going on inside of this function. Well, it's really easy. I can just go like that, put my breakpoint right there. And once that function triggers, as long as, or yeah, once that function triggers, it'll break there. So, and I don't have to refresh. Um, you can if you want. Um, and notice how when I refresh, nothing's breaking. Why is that, do you think? The function hasn't been triggered, so. Yeah, I haven't that triggered. Line isn't doing anything. Exactly, I haven't triggered a click event. So one, that's one thing that uh, you will get used to as you as you practice with this is kind of understanding when certain lines execute and when they don't. And this is another reason why you're going to be so much better at coding is because you're going to develop an intuition on when you expect your code to run and when you expect it not to. Um, console logs won't teach you that, but breakpoints will. So, all right, I'm going to click my button. Can I ask what, what your decisory is for where you put, like, when you're putting it in a function, is there like a specific place within a function that you like to do it? Does it just? It just depends on what you're looking for. Okay. You can put a breakpoint. So there are a few, there are a few rules on what you can and can't put a breakpoint on. Um, for example, I can't put a breakpoint or, or it doesn't really make sense to put a breakpoint on a line like this, for example. Um, now this will still work. Um, basically, this means break at the end of this function gap, which I don't know, I guess you could argue that this is fine, because now you at least see what all your variables are that happened. Um, but yeah, it just, it totally depends on what, on what you want to accomplish. Okay, well, can you tell me why you decided to put on line, line 10 versus line 11? Mm -hmm. Sure. So in this case, it's just so that I could step through each line starting from line 10 and just seeing what my values are. Perfect. Yeah, so in this case, like, so right now um, we are on line 10 and let's say I want to know what my counter inner text is. Okay, notice how my count is one, my inner text is the string one. And if I step through, or sorry, not step through, but step over. Oh, whoops, I, sorry, I was not in the spot that I thought I was. Let me restart that. That's uh, kind of related to my question. How, what's the difference between step over and step into? And... Yeah, that's a, that, is a, that is a great question. So let's, um, uh, let me give you an example. So I'm going to set this up in a slightly different way. So right now I'm literally, I'm repeating myself. I'm using a, this is a bad principle in coding to repeat yourself. Uh, what I want to do is I'm going to write a function called display count. Okay. And it's going to take my number, whatever it is, and it's going to say counter dot inner text equals x. And now what I can do is instead of repeating myself there and there, I can simply call my function. So I'm going to say display count, count. And then here I can invoke it again. And I'm going to say display count, whatever my count is. So now I've I've abstracted my logic away into this function. Okay, we're gonna look at what step into and step out of mean. Okay, so again, I'm gonna put my breakpoint here. 
uh, just so we can start from the beginning of our uh, callback logic. So stepping into and stepping out of are the opposite of each other. When you step into a function call, what that means is, I'm gonna click this button. What that means is that it's going to uh, essentially, it, it's, it's essentially like putting a breakpoint at the beginning of the function block or of the next function block. Okay, so if we look at where we're at currently, we're on line 12. Well, what's the next function call? The display count. Exactly. So display count is our next function call. So that means when I step into the next function call, that effectively should put my breakpoint. It's not actually a breakpoint, but what it does is it will pause the program at the beginning of that function block, which would be here. Okay, so uh, let's do that. Let's see what happens. I'm going to step into and let's see where it takes me. It takes me right into this function. So check it out. If I hover, notice how if I'm hovering over here, sorry, we got to click one more time. There we go. See how this lit up? Sometimes you have to click it twice. I don't know, it's a little shaky. So it kind of mo it moves down, but also if there's a function, it's going to go into it rather than just go by it. Correct. Guess, maybe. Yes, that's why it's called step into, and it only it. and it and it's only relevant to function calls. So uh, you can now see how see how this this parameter here is lit up when I hover over it. It actually tells me what it is because that's showing me hey display count is being called right here with whatever value that is until you notice that x is one and count is one. It's because they are literally the same thing. Right. And then if I step out of, well, you can imagine, like, you take a guess. What, what do you think stepping out of means? It like, takes you to line 14. Yeah, exactly. It just, it just leaps you out of the, the function that you're in and goes to the next line after the function that you're in. So there it is, line 14. Does that make sense? Yep. And so when you're when you're kind of within like a let's say you jumped into a function, but there's a lot yeah. of stuff in there, sure. you have to kind of keep stepping within that function. If you step over, uh -huh. does it just take you to the end of that function or does it does it you know give you all those details within that? So in. step over, step over is kind of like a line by line thing. Okay, so that would um, do that. So it yeah, line like by line. if you had a really long function, then stepping over would be kind of tedious. So that's why step step into or sorry step out of can be useful. Right. Whereas continue, um, if you this this is really good for when you kind of have already placed your skittle trail of breakpoints, so to speak, you can just go into the next breakpoint wherever they may be. Um, so okay. all these controls are, are just different ways of navigating through your code as it's executing. Got it. Yeah. So to be clear, when you, yep. when you, um, when you're in a, when you're using the breakpoint. Yes. Okay. And it comes to, a function that you've that you've uh, gotten to or whatever when yes. you go and like step over and you're, you're like yes. cool I've stepped over to this function and then you uh -huh. want to step into it uh -huh. you can then step over within that step sure in function. absolutely okay yep cool yep and then when you step out you just go back to where you were exactly like, okay yep cool. I, I kind of think of it as like a Mario game you yeah. can either jump you can run you can walk you can jump backwards, you know, it's whatever you want. You can sign up for the debugging Olympics. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, I, I cannot emphasize enough how important being able to be, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be comfortable with placing breakpoints, putting in watch variables, and 
using the various controls. Like I, I really cannot emphasize enough to you how much that will improve your just general coding ability. There's a little bit of time it takes. There's a little bit of a learning curve at first, just like with anything else. But I promise you that doing this consistently is going to vastly improve your coding ability exponentially. Like, I'm serious. Would you rather use the breakpoints in the Chrome developer tools or in the Visual Studio tools? That's a good question. It kind of it kind of depends. Sometimes if I'm feeling like really lazy and I, I just need to check something, I'll, I'll just do it in here. I think it's just a it's a it's a matter of preference. Um, usually I have my browser like on a different monitor. And so if I'm in my code, it's kind of nice to be able to just run it in VS Code so I don't have to like go back and forth. Um, but it's kind of a personal choice. But let me let me show you guys. I've got two more things to show you guys. Um, one is the, the Chrome Tools Dev extension. The, sorry, the Chrome Dev Tools extension. And we're then I'm going to open up a React project uh, that I was working on recently. And I'm going to show you how breakpoints will help. Or how, we're going to like step through this, this project um, together. Sweet. Yeah. So the first thing is the dev tool. So if you go to extensions, I've already got mine installed, but uh, it's the first thing that'll pop up. It's called the debugger for Chrome. Uh, there's also the debugger for Firefox. If you like to use Firefox instead of Chrome, um, I'm just used to the Chrome thing. I don't really have a preference, honestly, other than I'm used to this. So you download that, easy peasy. Now to use it, so basically all it lets you do is put breakpoints in your VS code as a replacement for putting breakpoints in here. That's, that's really all it's for. So what I'm going to do is um, uh, I'm going to create a new configuration. So we're going to get rid of this guy. Eh, well, no, we'll, we'll leave it there just for, and once you have the, once you have the um, extension uh, installed, when you click on this add configuration button, you'll actually see some options here. So there's Chrome attach, there's Chrome launch. Uh, like I said before, there's, there's two types. There's an attach type and a launch type. Uh, for this, I prefer to use launch um, because it will bootstrap your project from the beginning with breakpoints working as opposed to attach, which means that you would have already had to start it in some other environment. And then this is attaching to it. That isn't, in most cases, that's not what you want. So launch is the most straightforward. So in this one, um, there's a couple of, couple of slight um, extra things we gotta do. So the first thing is this URL. Now this is wrong. Uh, they use 8080 by default, but we we need to actually, uh, well, I shouldn't say this is wrong. It's just that this needs to match what you expect your code to be running on. Um, Brad, are you used to using the live server? Yeah, yeah, Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, so you'll notice that by default, the, um, the live server uses port 5500. So that's why when I go to port localhost 5500, I see, I see my code. Um, so you have a choice. You can either change the default port of live server to do 8080 or, and this is the easier way, just change this to 5500. Um, Otherwise this it'll will create a whole new instance, right? Say what? It'll pop up a whole new kind of served up for well version. no it, it does it no matter what the problem is that the live server is running a server on port 5500 and the only way to access it is to go to is to visit that uh, uh url okay. since you don't have anything running on 8080 um presumably nothing will happen 
So like you'll you'll see this error and you'll know immediately. So I'm going to select launch Chrome because again, that's what this is. You can change that, um, make it whatever you want. But if I hit play and I've got the default 8080, um, you're going to run into a problem. It'll spin for a while and then it'll say it can't be reached. And the reason why, of course, is because you don't have anything being served up from localhost Gosh. 8080. So okay, if you want it. that to work, you have to make sure to run live server and then change this to 5,500. And that's it. That's the, only, that's the only extra step you have to remember. So now if I go back to my debugger and I hit launch Chrome, it'll take a sec and then boom, there it is. And you'll notice a couple of things. First of all, if you have any extensions or anything, uh, be, you won't see them here, which is kind of annoying. Um, Cause like, you know, I use React DevTools and stuff. So I had, I had to reinstall it in this window. And that's the only reason why is because Chrome is actually creating a whole new, brand new instance of Chrome here. Um, so that's purely for debugging purposes. So you're not gonna see all your fancy stuff here. If you want to though, just reinstall them. And, and honestly, I kind of, I, I got used to it. I just installed only the extensions I needed um, for debugging purposes. So like React DevTools, which is pretty much the only thing I have and also Angular DevTools too. Um, if you- And so those will, those will stay once installed to yes. that launched version? Correct. Correct. Yep. Cool. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, cool. So you'll notice that now we can forget about the, the Chrome tab running over there. Now we can only worry about this one. Okay. Now the cool thing is, um, the cool thing is that, uh, I can go in my VS code and I'm gonna go back to my main.js and instead of putting breakpoints in the Chrome itself, I'm gonna put them here. So I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna click on this button and check it out. It takes me back here. Mm. And now it's lit up just like you were used to seeing it earlier. Um, we've got all of our stuff still here. Uh, let me move all those guys. And uh, so there we go. I can put my watch variables in here. I mean, I I prefer doing it this way in most cases only because I like the interface of VS Code better. I think it's just easier to work with. Um, plus you've got all your files and stuff here. Like it's just all in one place. So, but again, this is a personal preference of mine, but yeah, it's nice because you can, you have the same exact functionalities. Uh, you can continue, step over, step through, et cetera all the things. There we go. There we go. Finish is running. And now we're back to, now it goes to one again. Sweet. Yeah, so um, I highly recommend from now on, on every single one of your projects, trying to use the debugger as much as possible. I guarantee you, it will help you out a lot. I wish I had done it earlier, to be honest with you. Yeah. So any questions before we go of... into a React example? All good? Yep. Cool, all right, this is exciting. Okay, now um, let's go. So here's a little project I made with um, TypeScript and React. So don't worry about the fact that this is TypeScript. Um, we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be debugging, or not debugging, but we'll, we'll, I'll show you how you can like you know navigate through code and stuff. Uh, so. You know, you can imagine that this is a much more complicated project. Um, there's a lot of things going on. Um, see you, Brad. Hope that was helpful. Let me know if you have any questions.
uh, I'm on Slack, so you can find me. Okay, so here's this big giant pro project with lots of lots of files, lots of stuff going on, um, lots of things. So console logs are very difficult once you start dealing with hundreds and hundreds of files. It's, it's just unruly. And then plus the other thing, the other bad thing about console logs is that it's, it's literal code that's taking up space in your project and you don't want to deploy code that's console logs. For one, it looks scrappy. Two, it actually affects performance because console logging is actually a pretty intensive task. Um, and the third, you have to remember where you put all your console logs <laughs> and then you have to go find them. And that's annoying. Hmm. Whereas with breakpoints, you don't have to do that. You can just literally put breakpoints wherever the hell you want and it, it's not part of your code. So you don't have to worry about accidentally committing a bunch of console logs and then having your tech lead get mad at you for putting in unnecessary console logs. I've done that before. All right, so let's run this guy. Uh, I forget what I did for. I think that's just a game start. Was this the new app you made? Yeah. Yeah, my what, uh, what inspired I think I it. saw that. Yeah, so it's my well now ex my ex-girlfriend. I uh, built it for her because she wanted to have a way of tracking how long it's been since something or how long it is until something happens. And all the apps she found on the on the app store uh, didn't didn't work for what she wanted. So I built one for her and she loves it. So all right. So <laughs> uh, I, I, have, I have a lot of questions associated with that the concept. <laughs> 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 Go ahead. No, Keep in mind this is being recorded. Like, did you not did you not build it fast enough? And that's what she <laughs> left. <or> like... <laughs> yes, it was a poor UX experience. So <laughs> no, luckily it had nothing to do with the app itself. As far as I know, she still uses it. Okay. <laughs> so all right, the basic idea is, you know, you can, you can just to give you a quick tour, you can add events and it'll show up and you can see how long it's been since something, you can add things until, and uh, um, stuff like that. Okay, cool. And you can, you can see, you can toggle between the views, uh, you can filter by stuff, um, you can sort. Cool. All right, so a very basic to-do app, essentially. So, all right, let's just play around with the debugger. So let's say I want to know. You did say very basic, but you have like legit like sixty-eight thousand files. <laughs> so well, it, it does. It does. That's a simple it. app. It does it, okay, it does have a few cool features like you can add custom themes and and it uses uh, It's just not as simple as you made it sound. Okay, it is a little more complicated than I made it sound, but 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 it's nice and clean and it looks simple. Yes, it looks simple. That's the key. <laughs> That's Good what point. I was going for is I wanted it to look simple. But uh, yeah, so there's some cool stuff with forms um, and things that uh, as far as, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of stuff going on here. I won't go into the details, um, but, I, but I do want to show you how we can use the debugger to navigate something like this. So I was having a problem, also I'll show you with like a real example, where I had this weird problem where if I went to the screen and I edited and I went to like, if I clicked on 25, it would still show 24 occasionally. It would only do it if I did it at certain <laughs> times of the day. <laughs> and it was really annoying 
because it would work in the mornings, but it would not work in the afternoons. <laughs> like if you got too close to the next day or something. If I got too close to the next day, in fact, seven hours too close to the next day, oh, it would- You pinpointed uh, it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's awesome. And it has to do with uh, the way that times work in, in JavaScript and, and stuff. Well, it has to, not, not with JavaScript, but it has to do with the way that times are formatted. Um, I won't go into the details because that's not important, but what is important is how I gathered that, how I was able to pinpoint that problem. Console logs would have, I would still be here working on this if I was trying to do this with console logs. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how uh, I went about doing this. So if I go to the form where this is happening, so let's go to the event detail form. I'm going to go ahead and uh, put in my, where's my, oh, I use a hook. All right. So I've got this fancy use form hook that I made. It takes all this stuff. Okay, so I'm gonna put my breakpoint there. Okay, I'm gonna go back here. Oh, and I'm gonna also, uh, I don't remember if I put breakpoints in. Um, oh yeah, for this I didn't. I don't even think I used the extension. Let me just add. Let me add this configuration in here really quick. Go in here, create a launch file. Uh, we'll go to the Chrome. There we go. I'll we'll put this on three thousand. Cool. All righty. And now we will. So I'm running this on localhost 3000. Okay, so that's important. Now we'll just go ahead and run this guy. And we should see it here. Beautiful. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm gonna to go to my form. Notice, so I clicked on that button, which should take me to my form, but since I've got my breakpoints here, check it out. I'm now here. So nice. notice there's a lot of shit going on. Um, so if we look at just what the props object is, there's all this stuff. I've got on submit, I've got some event thing, I've got various things. Uh, I've got my on cancel, on submit. Uh, I've got in this closure, there's all this crap going on. So there's a lot of stuff here, um, which can be a little overwhelming. But suppose, so the problem that I, I was at least able to pinpoint down to the fact that, or down, I was able to pinpoint that something was wrong with the way that my date was being processed. So had to do with whenever I would select a new date, uh, it goes through this process of parsing the date, converting it into a different form that it can then display correctly and all this crap. So at some point during that process, uh, I was processing the date wrong. And so it was a matter of trying to figure out at what, where that was happening. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna kind of navigate down through this. So. And again, I don't expect you to like follow the logic here. The purpose here is just to show you how you can navigate your code using these uh, controls here. So, so don't worry about the logic, just worry about the fact that we can jump into function calls and see what those values are. So here I've got this function use form that controls my form data. So we're gonna step into that. One more time. One more time. There we go. Okay. Okay, sweet. Now I'm in this uh, file, my use form file. Notice it skips to other files too. So this is living in a totally different place. Um, so that's kind of cool. Okay, so now I'm in here. Um, all right, now we're looking at all this stuff. Okay. 
again, don't worry about the logic, but we can skip down and see, all right, I care about, since this is a form, uh, here's my here's my thing that I'm trying to populate. It's just a it's just an object that has a timestamp, a type, and a name, essentially. And uh, you know, I just want to set those values to what I care about. And uh, this is just telling me it's just a series of processes that take my new input that I've just typed in, and will validate for it validate it for me and it will also format it for me but we can just kind of step through some of these guys so we go here okay that's getting and really you you haven't typed anything in this is sort of the process to what boot up the modal mm -hmm. and display the fields for you mm -hmm. to edit correct yeah cool so then we're here and okay we get down to the end here's my field controls um cool all right so that's fine. I'll step out of here for a bit. Now we're back to where we were. Um, I'll hit continue for now. Uh, there's a re-render. Hit continue. And we are now here. Okay, cool. So uh, I want to know what happens when I click on this button and I select a new date. So I need to pinpoint the point where my date is getting processed. So uh, again, I'm going to put my breakpoint there and I'm going to now try to select a new date. So I'm going to pick, I don't know, let's go back like to the 22nd. Okay. Step down. Let's see what my, uh, here's this new value. That, oh no, that's not, is that the right value? I don't think I, sorry, one sec. I'm gonna go into that use form. It'll be a little easier from here. Okay. Go from right, go from the top. It's the uh, update field. Okay, this is my, this is the function that updates fields. That's why it's called that obviously. All right, let's try this again. So I'm over here. Uh, it's today. Go to Ash. Ah, did not mean to do that. All right, one sec. Okay, I'm going to go here and I'm going to select that date. Okay, here we go. Update field. Looks like it's getting called. Okay, timestamp. We're setting a date. So this is the property. Okay, that's the value. Oh, okay, cool. So there's my value that is is being uh, chosen. Okay, so now we've got this whole set of processes that's happening. So let's step into this unmask function. Let's see. Uh, let's see what that guy's all about. So we'll step into there. Here's unmask and check it out. So this is the thing that takes a date. Uh, or sorry, takes a takes a string value and converts it into a date based on what my form data types are. Now you'll notice that here's this part right here. Now this is what I added later when I figured out what my problem was, is that I wasn't providing the correct offset. I was noticing right at this moment when I created a date using that value, it was giving me a date that was exactly seven hours off <laughs> because Mountain State time is seven hours off from uh, what's called universal something time, UTC. I forget what that stands for. Um, there's a there's an offset from that universal time, and that was essentially causing the problem. So I had so I was able to by using breakpoints, I could get down to this point, and with that exact date that I was entering in, I could see exactly at this very line what was going on wrong, and I was able to fix it by adding this offset here. And I now created a new date with that new offset and everything was fine.
but that would be really tricky with a console log. Yeah. It'd be pretty much not impossible, but it would be, it, 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 it just wouldn't be helpful. So, um, that cool. is why the debugger is really awesome. It saves you a lot of time. It, uh, it gives you a lot of insight into not only how your program's working, but just like how JavaScript works. Um, it's kind of cool. Learned a lot from it. So, so in that scenario, I if you had highly recommend, it. sorry, go ahead. In that scenario, if you had console logged it, it would have given you the date, but it wouldn't give you the explanation for how you're getting it. Oh my God. I know it'd be awful. Like it wouldn't, it, it, it would give you so little to go on. So like if I was in my, uh, where is it? Detail form. Here we go. So like, okay, here's my detail form and stuff. And I could be like, okay, um, well, this is weird. I'm going to console log my form controls dot um, field controls dot timestamp. Cool. And uh, I'm going to get rid of my breakpoints here just so we can get an idea of what's going on. Okay, I'm going to open up our dev tools here to our console. Okay, <laughs> so there's my, there's my thing. Okay, cool. And I can be like, all right, let's select a new date. Okay, so like I'm able to see that, but like literally every time I type, I see that literally every time I do anything and this is just getting populated with this, with this data and they're like maybe seeing this raw value compared to this display value like could give me some hints but like again, I don't, I don't actually get to go into the logic of how this is being transformed into that, and vice versa, just from console logging. So there's just a lot of limitations with console logging. Now, sometimes a, a quick level console log. Just to just to like take a glance at something, perfectly fine. You know, I do that. Well, it has other. Like, it's really useful when you're getting like data from an API or something. Well, that's when you use the network tab. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> like call to log is purely the reason why it's called a log is because it's purely for logging. If it was a debugger, it would be called console debug but it's not, it's just for, it's for outputting information. Con like console log is a great tool, but it's not for debugging. Like it's not for troubleshooting. That's not what it's for. Um, it's just, it's just using the wrong tool for the, it's using a, the wrong tool for the wrong job. Um, the proper tool is the, is the debugger. And that is how you use it. I think I wanted to point out that console table would be more useful in the case that I was talking about anyway. Mm -hmm. Console table is pretty cool. Actually, I don't know if that will work in this example. Well, yeah, but yeah, getting, but yeah, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. Like it's, it's really great for like, uh, for outputting information. Like when you're not trying to solve like a logical problem or something, and you just want to like view some information, that's what, that's what console log is for and that's what console tables for that's what the whole console library is for it's just for getting a snapshot of data which is really helpful um you know like it's not like you should never use console logs or anything it's just use it for what it's for which is for outputting information that i mean that distinction makes sense uh, yeah not not solving logic questions 
Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I just think that um, people conflate the two. Uh, whereas, you know... Points have been... I, I don't know if it's just the way the lessons are, or... I mean, because it's not like I did a lot of, like, my own research on breakpoints mm -hmm. or anything, but... Yeah. Just as we learn them, I it certainly was more difficult than it seemed it was worth at the time. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, hell, I didn't even know that the breakpoint stops the line before. Wait, sorry, what was that last part? I didn't even know that the the break, like where you put the breakpoint is the line after where it stops. No, it's the line before. Or yeah, before I mean, like I, yeah, I yeah. didn't know that. Yeah, that's that threw me for a, a loop um, a couple of times because, like, it's not intuitive, really. You you would think that you would see the output of that line that you put the breakpoint in. But once you think of it as a bookmark, then I think it makes a little more sense. Um, but, well, yeah. I would just try and use it and have the code do things and i have no idea what it was doing you know right right basically and now what you can do is anytime you get the temptation to put a console log somewhere instead of putting a console log put a breakpoint and you're like can you add a breakpoint with like without using you know click it on the side is there a way to just like uh call breakpoint in your code no yeah because the whole purpose so. is to is to separate your code from how it's being executed it would defeat right. the whole purpose yeah <laughs> yeah because then at that point it's like you might as well use a console lock. <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you can you can use breakpoints to um figure out how you're passing props oh hell yeah yeah like like check this out so for example um let me find a place where i'm clearly passing in props somewhere um okay look check this out so my event detail form so actually no let me find an even simpler one um not very simple things on here uh, like, I hey, I have to jet. Hi, right, man. See you Thanks then. again, Ben. Really appreciate yeah. it. You are welcome. I hope that was helpful. Super helpful, as always. Right on. Okay, here we go. So here's this uh, here's this icon button, uh, which I am... No, shit, that's from Team UI. Let me find one that I wrote so that it's easier to pinpoint. All right, here we go. So a radio button. Okay, so my radio button is uh, just a... React component that takes uh, these guys as props. I don't know if you're familiar with TypeScript. Um, no. I, I, I wouldn't expect I mean, I know you to. It is, but yeah. Um, yeah. So basically, this is just defining the shape of props. This is saying, hey, you're an object that has these properties. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. So, like, and this has to be a string, or I'm going to yell at you. Exactly. Exactly. So, okay. So these, these are my. This is my definition. What's an F? <laughs> uh, that is a, um, it's called a generic type. If you ever want a TypeScript lesson, hit me up. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a tour. Oh, cool. Yeah. So think of it as just a dynamic type. It's not a string necessarily. It's not null. It's not, it's not an array. It's a variable type. It could be anything. Um, but it's, it's, uh, restricted by this idea. Anyways, it's a, it's, it's saying that it's saying that this is a key or a property of whatever type that is, whatever it is. So that's all that is. So why can't so in this, you, sorry, go ahead. You go like any extends key of instead of F extends Q. Well, because I want to be very precise about what F is. Um, any is a useless type. 
Okay. <laughs> it's like there's no point in using TypeScript if you're going to use the the word any. Oh, okay. And I guess that's kind of tangential from what you're trying to explain. <laughs> yeah, but it, again, if you ever want to learn TypeScript, let me know. I it's like my favorite thing. So anyway, so here's here's props. This is the shape of of props. These are what these are the types that it's expecting. So that means that if I put a breakpoint, I'm going to put it on the return statement of my function. Um, and uh, we're just going to take a look at what my props are. So here, as you can see, I'm just destructuring it. Um, so by putting my breakpoint here, I'll be able to see all of the values that have been defined up until that point. So I'm going to go ahead and re start that and uh, I'm going to click on this guy to open up a form and boom we go back to here and now we are on line 37 and if we take a look in the debug menu notice there's all this all this stuff um, but what's really great is check it out here's props and check it out. It matches everything that we had defined up here. And if we go back to another folder, um, gotta, sorry, I gotta hide my stupid Zoom controls are driving me crazy. Okay, so if we go back to the event detail form, uh, which of course is rendering radio buttons, you'll notice that, okay, the radio button that I'm on right now happens to be the one with the label sent. So obviously it's the first radio button because that's the first, you know, it's the first breakpoint um, that gets hit is this first radio button. So as you can see, my label has been passed in as since my radio group is called paper chain type. My radio value is this uh, string called since. Um, it's an enum, but that's a TypeScript thing. Uh, my field name uh, is type. That's the property on this object that I am uh, trying to uh, create from this form. Form controls is just the interface for controlling, you know, whether or not it's pristine, whether the form is valid, contains things like update fields. It's just a way of interacting with my form. Uh, all that stuff gets passed into the radio and we can see it as props here. Pretty cool, right? Yeah, I've I've usually just used the Chrome Dev tools to see how my props are passed. Mm -hmm. And that works too. Like, yeah, so the, the React Dev tools are really fantastic um, because uh, it's, it's another way of looking at the same information. Um, so I go back and forth between looking at the uh, um, React props and, or sorry, I go back and forth between looking at the React dev tools and the uh, VS Code debugger because they're, they serve different purposes. Um, so yeah, that's, they're, they're together, they, they're, they're amazing when you pair the two. Um, Cause like, it's really, it's really, the React Dev tools are really great for like only looking at the data you see in um, state and props. You can kind of get a snapshot of what's there, which is really fantastic. Uh, the problem, the downside, or not even really the downside. It's just that there's information that it doesn't show that the debugger can make up for. So like if you're trying to figure out a logical problem with your app, looking at what's in state and props isn't gonna help you. Um, but the debugger can at least help you navigate through that logical algorithm or sequence that you're trying to fix. Makes sense. Yeah. Man, your code is so complex. <laughs> <laughs> oh. It's 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 actually not. It's not that it's complex. It's just that it's abstract. I've I've 
I've organized it into lots of different things. So like, for example, um, what looks TXS, complicated TSX is actually, is, uh, is the what? Type for, I assume TSX is JSX for TypeScript. Yep, or, that's right. That's correct. Sorry, I interrupted you. No, no, you're good. Yeah, no, it's actually, um, this is kind of a tangent, but since you asked, um, the the code itself is is really not too crazy. All it is is I've got my like library of of generic components. So I've got like my form field components, like a date picker, um, radio, text field. These are just the things that my app uses. And the core of it is that I have this function called use form, which is just a custom hook. The whole purpose of it is to be able to do something like this, which is to provide a, so here's my, um, the way it works is it takes two arguments. The first one is a set of field configurations, which just means, hey, what data type is it? And what, um, what are the rules for, for determining whether this form is valid? So the most common one is like required. So the value, the, the form can't be valid if this field is missing, for example, right? Um, this particular one uh, has some other rules too. Not only is it required, but it also has to meet the, the rules defined by this particular um, validator. And this just has to do with, with I, can't, I can't create a time. I can't say that something is since tomorrow. That doesn't make any sense, <laughs> right? So therefore I'm having a message display that it must be before today. So the moment that I do that, if I pick something that's before today, then the form's valid. If that's missing, oh, it's invalid. Now I can't submit it. So it's just logic for that governs stuff like that. But I wanted to make that generic, like universal. So I wanted to be able to pass in any object with any configuration, with any set of validators, with any set of types and some starting values and have my form and whatever val whatever um, input values I put in there to just handle it all automatically. So each type of input has a very um, almost universal interface where I just pass in form controls from that hook and it handles all that internally. And then whatever else is unique to that particular type of input, whether it's a radio or a text field or a date picker, those are there, but they all can take form controls. So wait, where is form controls? Yeah, sure. Form controls lives up here. So form controls is the output of the oh, use form hook. Okay. Yeah. And when you look at the use form hook, this is just a function that um, uh, okay, so there's the use form factory. Okay, so, so okay, this does get a little complicated. <laughs> this function outputs that function that I just told you about. <laughs> so when you go to this config, this is where I can customize all the different behaviors I want. So like if I want, um, I want to be able to, where did I put it? Here it is. Oh, no, oh, that's not it. Where is it? Here we go. Okay. I want to define what my formatters are and what my validators are. So here's that function here that defines whether or not my form is valid based on uh, this, um, whether it's a since event or an until event. 
Oh, okay. I see. Okay. So, so what happens is I then create that function configured with those um, formatters and, and validators. So this guy right here takes those configurations and creates the hook called use form, which I can then use in multiple places with my actual form values for that particular form. God. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's complicated, but it makes it a lot easier to mean. Yeah, it's just practice. I mean, I've been doing this for like four years, so. How many big things have you built like this in those four years? Um, Not even saying this is huge or anything, but. I've built, I mean, I don't know. I've, I do lots of different random projects. Um, I've only built like two or three like functional applications. Um, built a website for my friend. Um, built this guy for my friend. Just, it's like an audio player. You can send emails from it and stuff. This was built in Angular, uh, but not too many. I like to just build like little random mini projects and stuff, just whatever is interesting to me at a given time. So this, how, like how many man hours is this? This was about a week and a half, maybe like total of 25 man hours, maybe just working like a couple hours a day. God, I think I took 20 hours on Zen Garden. <laughs> hey, man, when I did Zen Garden, it took me twice that long. So you got me beat. <laughs> <laughs> Do you find that TypeScript makes it faster? Uh, uh, it makes it more efficient. I'm never, ever going back. TypeScript is the best. TypeScript is so awesome. It was really frustrating to learn, though. I will admit that. It, you know, reading about it, I, I thought there was, um, I thought there were already things in JavaScript that allowed you to check types and require not really. types. Not, not really, because you can't, um, okay. Let me qualify that. Yes, there are, but the problem is that it all happens at runtime. That's what the response was. But I, I just, I don't understand the distinction between sure, yeah, runtime yeah. Um, and compiling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, let me, let me, uh, I'll, uh, I'll explain. Um, let me just get rid of these guys. I don't need those. Ad hoc TypeScript lesson. <laughs> yeah. No worries at all. I, I, dude, I love this stuff. Um, let me, I'm just going to stop the recording just so that it's not like a two hour long recording where only half of it is relevant to the actual. Thing. Do you ever edit these or you just put it out? However, I, I do not edit it at all. Um, to be honest with you. They're going to get I'm not the one that means script. I'm